Hey Gadget Groupies, it's time for another showdown fight for blood! <laughs> Pitting the new LG V10 against the Samsung Galaxy S6 Edge Plus. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a battle for the fashion phablet of the year. Starting off with front faces, both of these phones have 5.7 inch main displays, and both are clocking in at a resolution of 2560 by 1440. Though I will give Samsung the subtle nod here for the AMOLED display over the LCD in the LG. You guys should know by now, I'm a sucker for a nice, juicy, contrasty AMOLED display, and Samsung's high brightness mode does does outpace LGs when using the phone in direct sunlight. Though I gotta flip the script when it comes to display gimmicks, as I find the little ticker display on the LG to be far more useful and more functional than the software tweaks to bring up the edge shortcuts on the Galaxy S6. As you saw on my home screens, you've gotta nail the gesture to get this little menu out. It blurs out the rest of your screen, takes up screen real estate, whereas the little shortcuts and docked controls on the V10 are just easier to access and don't block your ability to use the rest of your phone. It's actually kinda handy being able to go directly to music player controls, for example, without even having to pull your notification shade. We're dealing with two fairly large phones here, but the V10 is slightly larger than the edge in every single metric. It's a taller phone, it's slightly wider, and it's definitely just a little bit thicker than Samsung Samsung's fashion phablet. As we compare the materials being used for both of these devices, I've had a pretty consistent track record. I'm just not the biggest fan of glass as the main material for the front and back of a smartphone. This combination of aluminum and glass is sexy as hell. This is one of the prettiest devices that I think anyone has ever made in the history of making mobile, gadget, consumer electronics. But daily use on the edge for me has been something of an ergonomic nightmare, which we'll talk about in just a bit. This combination of stainless steel rails on the sides and the silicone mesh on the back of the V10 has become one of my ultimate time favorite build constructions for any device ever. It's something of a spiritual successor to phones like the Galaxy Note 4. I think this metal and silicone combination looks sharp, and it's very easy to hold onto throughout your day, even with sweaty paws like mine. Now, like I just mentioned, the Edge has been something of an ergonomic nightmare for someone like me. First of all, I'm not the biggest fan of phablets. I do like my phones just a little bit smaller, and so this size is very well containing that 5.7 inch screen. It is pretty remarkable how much screen Samsung has crammed into this device. But glass Glass as a main material is a little slick, and the way that the screen tapers on the sides into this metal edge can make holding onto this phone a little tricky without interacting with screen elements. You don't have the flat edges that you do on a Galaxy Note. These side metal bands taper away from the back of the screen, which makes you feel like you're constantly trying to grip the phone on a very thin strip of metal. Just giving you guys that close up, it's right here where the glass meets that metal edge. That's where you feel like you're holding onto the phone the most, which isn't a lot of material real estate to get a good grip on a large and slippery device. It seems to manifest as a problem fairly regularly when I'm using the phone as a camera. As I'm trying to hold onto the corners of the device, not block any of the microphones on the top or bottom of the phone, and the pads of my fingers start to roll on top of the edge of this curved screen, that's where I get issues with autofocus not working accurately, as the phone is mistaking screen taps from the pads of my fingers at the corners for what I'm trying to work on the, in the middle of my composition window. And I have had the occasional issue holding the phone while trying to play a game like Marvel Future Fight, where controls for special abilities are docked at the bottom of the screen, and it's not an accurate tap as you know the screen is curving through part of that. So your finger isn't actually hitting the full button. It's sort of, you got to kind of mash it in there. And what's also been an issue is Samsung's insistence on continuing to put the fingerprint scanner inside their hardware home button at the bottom of the phone. For people with average sized and smaller hands like me, that's a lot of a dance. That's a big dance, you know, shifting the phone around, balancing it on fingertips to try and reach this home button down here to unlock the device with the thumb. And I just don't feel that the edge gives us those reasons for two-handed usage like the Note does. With the Note, you pull out the S Pen, you got your stylus, and it makes sense that you would have both hands occupied for using that device, but the Edge doesn't really have that kind of productivity benefit to it. So for someone like me, I've got a good grip on the phone right now, I can't really quite get it to scan, nope, it's going to tell me I can't, so I've got to move the phone, usually bracing it on a pinky, and then get it to pop back open again. And I've retrained the fingerprint scanner several times trying to scan the bottom side edge of my thumb to minimize how much I'd have to move the phone around, but it still doesn't seem to mitigate that need that I have to shift the phone while holding it to unlock the phone. Actually, in most day-to-day -day operation, I've turned off the fingerprint scanner and I just go back to a pattern lock. I, I turned the fingerprint scanner back on for this video just so I could show you why I don't use the fingerprint scanner as much as I'd like to on the edge. Now, while the V10 is larger in every single dimension, I don't have those ergonomic issues like I did on the edge. While I'm holding the phone in the most secure way possible, my index finger is very easily able to reach the volume controls and the home button fingerprint scanner. Very simple hardware shortcuts allow me to turn the phone on, open a memo app, fire up the camera, 
and I don't have to shift the phone around in my hand at all to hit any of those controls. I use the power button to turn it on, it automatically scans my fingerprint while it's still on the power button, and I'm into my phone. It's completely unlocked. So I don't actually think the LG fingerprint scanner is more accurate or more powerful or even faster than the fingerprint scanner on the Samsung. It's just literally the placement of the fingerprint scanner makes using it a bit more accurate. And the same also holds true for using the phone like a camera. These rails on the sides of the phone are a little bit fatter. They do take up a little bit more space, but they also don't encroach on the screen while I'm holding the phone very firmly or very securely. My, the pads of my fingers aren't in any danger of touching any part of the screen, which is very helpful, especially on this bottom edge, is that's where all of our manual controls are. And speaking of these cameras, the hardware on the backs of both of these phones are very, very evenly matched. They're both using half inch 16 megapixel camera sensors, great optics, fast apertures. You're likely to get stunning images and video out of both of these phones. Where I will give LG the subtle nod, and this is a very subtle nod, is on their laser autofocusing system. There's this beautiful slide and lock just as it latches onto your subject, where I find the Samsung autofocus is a little bit twitchier in how it latches on and it pulses just a little bit more while you're using the autofocus for video. Now, taking a look at the camera software, I'm definitely siding with LG for this generation of phones. Samsung has made some incredible improvements to their image capturing software and image processing, but the various modes and the layout for how you get to those modes on the V10 is easier and we have more variety for people of differing skill levels. Samsung docks commonly use settings here on the side, but their main menu settings take you away from your composition window. Even if this were sort of translucent, semi-transparent, and you could still see kind of what you were doing, you just need to make a quick tweak to your video size or whether or not you want to use grid lines or something like that. But this completely removes you from the act of composing. And their full auto mode is definitely easy to use, but we kind of hide other modes in these sort of fun and gimmicky modes. So we go into our modes menu, there we can find our pro mode, and then we get expanded controls on our shutter speed, our ISO, white balance, and manual focus. The one advantage this camera app does have over the LG, which we're going to talk about here in a sec, are our color modes. And these move beyond just silly filters for aging our photos or making them look, uh, you know, older or vintagey. We can get into really fine granular controls for color, temperature, tint, contrast, saturation, highlights, shadow detail. This collection of image manipulations I really wish we had on LG's camera app. The V10 docks very distinctly separate video and photo modes in that little ticker box at the top of the screen. And for all those people who talk about whether or not a camera app is intuitive, I still haven't found anything as easy to use as their simple mode. It's just one big composition window. You tap where you want the screen to focus and then it takes a picture. There's no nothing else to distract you, no other settings that you need to control or look at. Their auto mode brings in a couple simple controls, the ability to shoot photos or videos, flip around to the front facing cameras, and then uh, other little fun gimmicky things like uh, the multi view, which takes a photo from both of the front cameras and then the back camera panorama mode. Both of these phones have phenomenal panorama stitching. And then LG does have an expanded menu option, but none of these take you out of your composition window. Nothing ever completely blocks your screen away from utilizing the camera on the back of the phone. So even if I want to change my video resolution, I get all of the options for what I want to shoot, but I'm still able to see what I'm trying to compose. Which then, we can take that level of control even one step further by going into the phenomenal manual modes that LG provides for both photos and videos. Tons of information about what the camera is trying to capture, the shutter speed, the ISO, the exposure, the white balance, whether or not you're using autofocus, and then a histogram to let you know that your shot is being properly exposed. We get all of the same controls like white balance, manual focus, ISO, shutter speed, exposure, value. And then when we come into our expanded menus, we have multiple video aspect ratios and resolutions. We have multiple frame rates that we can shoot depending on that resolution. And then we have control over bitrate, which with UHD video at 30 frames per second, we can shoot up to a 64 megabit per second bitrate, which is even higher than what Samsung provided on the Note 5 and Edge Plus. Each minute of video from the V10 is gonna come in at a whopping 460 megabytes of storage. But one of the exciting video modes actually competes directly directly against one of Samsung's middle resolutions on their video setting. So we have full HD, full HD at 60 frames per second, and quad HD, 2560 by 1440, a proper 2K video resolution. And I mentioned this during my review, my full review on the V10, but I'd kind of written off that LG has this FHD cinema mode. And I really expected that just to be a crop from 1920, so that it would make the, uh, the vertical resolution skinnier, but it would still just basically be 1080p video. 
So I was shocked to find that the full HD cinema mode on the LG V10 is actually a 2K crop. It's 2560 by 1080, and we still have access to a 60 frame per second mode while shooting 2K, which is something that Samsung doesn't even offer. Feature for feature, spec for spec, this camera app plus hardware combination is absolutely top spot right now for best camera of the year. Now in daily operation, these two phones perform very similarly to each other. I hate that, you know, like, oh, let me flip through the home screen so I can show you how smooth everything works on the home screens in the app drawer. It's really smooth performance. Both of these phones can get me around the Android UI just fine. Though I have to give the Samsung the nod for those of you who are into gaming. The V10 is not a slouch. You'll have very nice gaming experiences, but it's taken to a whole nother level on the Galaxy S6 Edge Plus. And if you've been watching my videos, you've heard me make this comparison a number of times, but the Galaxy represents a nice PC gaming experience, then the V10 is something more akin to a console gaming experience, PC Master Race for Life. In adding support for things like split windows, Samsung also gets the nod here in having far more support for the various apps and services which can be used in their dual view mode. We have most of our key services on the LG, but just not nearly the same level of support for making sure that we can use this large screen to display two apps at the same time. This is really really something that needs to be fixed by Google is Android could really benefit from having some built-in support for app multitasking. I mean, just look at the screens on those Nexus devices. They're dying for being able to display two things at the same time. And the little ergonomic battles between these two phones rage on in how you can control them one-handed. The shortcut to activate one-handed mode on the Samsung is easier and more reliable to get to in a triple click on the home button. And it shrinks the screen down so that you can still use it uh, with one thumb. Whereas on the LG, it's a swipe across your bottom dock of controls. When I'm actually out and about using the phone in real world situations, that swipe across the full edge of the screen is actually one of the gestures that I have trouble reaching on this phone, it's so large. So I've got to stop and go to two hands and then I can go back to one hand to activate the screen shrink mode. But once I've activated the screen shrink mode, I've got more options for customizing the experience how I would want to do it on the V10. On the edge, I can pick a right-handed or a left-handed dock. On the V10, I can actually move the full phone screen around, place it wherever I want, and then control the size of the display. So maybe I don't want it fully that small, I can make it bigger. So once I'm in the one-handed mode, I like the V10 better but I like getting to the one-handed mode better on the Samsung. And I gotta give a shout out to the little tweak of adding a shortcut down in the bottom of my dock to pull my notification shade. Again, for this phone being so large, there are a couple really nice little software tweaks to minimize the amount of hand dancing you need to do to reach everything on the phone and to navigate the UI properly. The speakers between these two phones are kind of a wash. They're both pushing the limits of what we can do with a single bottom firing speaker. They sound nice, there's punchy audio, you're not gonna miss ringtones and alerts, especially especially if the speaker is pointing up out of your pocket or purse. And in really trying to listen back to playback on both of these devices, it's really difficult for me to declare one clear winner over the other. Now, what I'm shocked to be saying this year is that I actually prefer the headphone audio quality on the LG over the Samsung. Both of these devices are now using high quality DACs for audio output over headphones. And they both join the iPhone and HTC in much higher quality audio reproduction. But LG has managed to outfit their headphone jack with an amp that's capable of producing two to three decibels more sound with the same noise floor as Samsung's solution. So your signal to noise ratio is higher on the LG. Now, subjectively, when it comes to the actual audio playback, I think I actually do like the Samsung just a little bit better. It's just a little bit flatter. It's a little bit more even EQ adjustments. And I think the LG is working just a little harder at making the audio a bit more colorful. But both of these devices are actually doing a better job, in my opinion, than where we are with the iPhone 6S these days. Where Apple is really starting to juice the bass and the treble, these phones are a little bit more accurate in their overall audio reproduction. These two phones offer up a fun fight when we start talking about battery life. Standby times on the Galaxy are better, but when we get into mixed usage, my battery experiences on these two phones have been very similar, with the exception of shooting super high quality video. That does seem to drain the battery faster on my V10 than it does on the Edge. If you're really relying on your mobile phone for ultra HD, super high quality video, you really do want to have a power management solution in place and I think you'll get just a little bit more runtime out of the Edge than you will out of the V10. Both of these phones have quick charging, but I do think Samsung's solution with the Exynos chipset does charge the phone a little bit faster than LG's Qualcomm solution. And I really do want to give Samsung the nod for building wireless charging directly into the phone casing. While on the V10, there is support for wireless charging, but we'll have to await LG delivering on their new backplates to activate that feature. That being said, the LG still does come with the benefit of being able to pop off the backplate. 
So if you invest in a spare battery, you can get to fully charged faster than you can with any kind of quick charging on a Galaxy. And while I've got the back torn off the V10, we should probably also talk about storage. As Samsung starts us off with 32 gigabytes of storage on the edge and then an extra $100 climbs you up to 64, the LG is only gonna come in one flavor, 64 gigabytes of storage, and we haven't lost the ability to add more via micro SD card. And that really becomes the last major talking point between these two phones weighing all of the pros and cons and build and style and fashion and design against the various price points that these devices are gonna be delivered at. At the time this video was shot, we still didn't have pricing and availability confirmation for carriers here in the United States for the V10. We're sort of loosely basing our estimates off of what this phone sells for in South Korea, which is just under the $700 price point. That means when compared to a 64 gigabyte edge, you're coming in $200 less than Samsung's offering. That's a pretty big jump, and it's hard to ignore the bang for buck that you get with LG's fashion phablet. It really does make this a fascinating conversation to me is I think Samsung has done an incredible job of cramming all of the guts of a modern smartphone into as slim and as sleek a shell as possible. But it's meant giving up a few things that we geeks kind of like, even down to things like the IR blaster to use your phone as a universal remote control. That's a feature I use a lot to control all of the stuff attached to our TV, and I didn't have to give it up on the V10. That level of attention to design and fit and finish does require a higher price point to shrink all of that stuff down. And I bet if LG had delivered this phone at a $1,000 price point, they probably could have come up with something that sucked even more air out of the general build. But in that all gadgets are a series of compromises, I can't say that LG is way off the mark in delivering on the V10. I think they've chosen their battles very appropriately for launching a new line of phone. But of course, I want I want to hear from you folks. What do you want to see in a gadget beyond just the ability to get your work done, but in something that will complement your style, your fashion? And also let me know in what technology features and gimmicks you might be looking forward to on future smartphone purchases. Those are the kind of conversations I love getting into. So as always, folks, thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe for more rambling battle fight for blood comparisons like these. And I would not be able to continue producing on this channel if you all weren't out there supporting it, either by hitting the fan funding, shopping via my Amazon affiliate links, grabbing yourself a free audiobook or shopping for a loot crate with the links below this video, or by sharing my videos on your favorite social sites like Reddit and Facebook and Twitter and the Googles Plus, so please keep bringing more cool people to the party. Hit that thumbs up button, and I will catch you all on the next comparison.